Today we're going to be talking about the Java Message Service, JMS, and quite simply it enables us to send messages around an enterprise application. A message, pretty much like you would expect it to be, just some information that is sent from some place to another place. And we will set up clients. Various software components can act as clients, and those clients will be able to create and send messages, receive and read messages, and process them accordingly. The whole idea about the JMS is that it sits in between the clients, so the clients are not tightly coupled. So there's no longer going to be any communication dependency between the clients themselves, and they'll act via the messaging provider. So this loose coupling enables the sender and the receiver to know very little, if anything, about each other. They don't even have to be available at the same time, so we can have asynchronous communication now. And this will make our applications a lot more flexible in terms of the, the communications that can take place between clients. The only thing that we do need to have uh, agreed between the sender and the receiver is this concept about knowing the message format. There are different types of messages, as we shall see a, a little bit later. And as long as the client and the sender are, are expecting to use the same format, then the communication will be trouble-free. So the Java Message Service API allows applications to create, send, receive and read messages. That communication can either be synchronous or asynchronous, although we'll define a little more clearly what that means in a few minutes. And the messages, when they are received by the messaging service, can either be pushed out to the receiving client or will be pulled by the receiving client. We can also ensure that a message is delivered exactly once. We can also ensure that if a message is missed for some reason, it will be delivered again until it has been received and receipt has been acknowledged. We are able to define lower levels of reliability if we want to. Why would we want to use the JMS? Well, first of all, it's about removing dependency between the sender and the receiver. If the sender cannot guarantee that the receiver will be active when the sender wants to send a message, we would want to use the Java messaging service because we can send messages that will be held by the message service until the recipient is ready to receive it. And so really it's all about whether we want asynchronous communication or not. Up until now we've been using synchronous communication, that is, when the sender wants to send a message, then that will be done synchronously, essentially by calling a method in the, in the receiving client. And the, the method call, with its accompanying parameters, constitute the message. This is now going to give us the option of using asynchronous communication. And that kind of communication can be used in all kinds of application areas. I've got here a, an example that's taken from the Oracle website that shows some kind of uh, manufacturing application where you've got various parts, various components of that application. The accounting component, the sales component and so on. And we can see that it might be that when accounting goes home for the night, maybe the application there could be shut down. But the factory might be operating 24-7, in which case information about parts will be sent to accounting all the way through the night. And we wouldn't want those messages to be lost. And so asynchronous communication would be very useful here. So that when accounting comes back online at 8 o'clock the next morning, all those messages that have built up during the course of the night will then be received and processed. We're going to take a look for a few minutes at the features of the JMS API. Message-driven beans are right at the center of this, and they are a kind of enterprise bean that enables asynchronous consumption of messages. We're also able to define whether these message beans process messages concurrently or not. And therefore, it's quite feasible that multiple messages can be arriving and we'll have multiple instances of the message bean handling those messages. The final point here is about transactions. We've talked quite a bit about transactions already over the past few weeks. The idea being that we want various operations, some of which will be quite complicated, to complete entirely and never complete partially. So that if there's a part of that complex operation that cannot complete, then the entire operation will be rolled back. 
and transactions facilitate that. We can use message-driven beans and therefore the whole idea of messaging within the context of transactions. So if a message is received as part of a transaction and that transaction has to be rolled back, the message itself will be rolled back and will be as if it had not been sent to the recipient. The JMS provider will then recognize that the transaction has rolled back and will attempt at a subsequent time another sending of that same message. The participants that we've got, well, there are four types. The JMS provider, which is a messaging system that implements the JMS API. The clients are the Java classes that send and receive messages. We write those clients. The messages are the objects that carry the information between the clients. And then we have these administered objects that are pre-configured JMS objects that are created by the administrator for use by clients. How those get created will vary. Sometimes they might be by a, a manual intervention in the enterprise server. Sometimes it'll be done automatically. Now there are two types of those administered objects, a connection factory and a destination. The connection factory is what the client uses to connect with a provider. Now the JMS provider, that's the, the bit of software that provides the messaging service. So that provider sits somewhere in the system and we'll use a connection factory to obtain a connection to that provider. And then when we've got a connection to the provider, we're able to get hold of a destination. And that destination will be, to use the terminology that I'll introduce a little bit later, either a queue or a topic. Our clients will make use of Jindi to obtain connections to the providers and also the destinations. So when the administrator is setting up these administered objects, part of that setup will include entries in the Jindi. Now there are two styles of messaging, point to point, publish and subscribe. Let's take a look at each of those. Point to point is where a sending client sends a message to a receiving client via a message queue. The diagram perhaps explains it a little better. You can see that we have a queue. That is a destination. That destination is where the client, the sending client, will send a message. That message will be held in the queue until the receiving client consumes that message. Now there are no timing dependencies between client one and client two, in as much as client one can send the message even if client two does not yet exist. And client two can consume a message even if client one has shut down. And as long as the queue is active, the client number one can send as many messages as it wants and those messages will be stored. And then client two can consume those until there's nothing left in the queue. As well as consuming a message, the second client, the receiving client, must also acknowledge that it has processed the message. And that will tell the queue that the message has been received and processed and therefore can be disposed of. With a queue, there is only one possible recipient. So there is one client at the end of the queue that will receive the messages. In contrast with that, the publish and subscribe mechanism will allow there to be multiple clients that receive messages sent by the sender. So we can have zero or more subscribers that will consume messages that are published by the sender. And again, in the diagram, there's a bit more clarity. Client number one will send a message, it's called publishing the message, to a topic within that provider. That destination will have a number of topics. If a client is subscribed to a particular topic, when that message is sent or published, the client will receive delivery of that message. And this illustrates the difference between the push and the pull. In the queue scenario with the point to point, the receiving client will pull the message when it is ready to receive it. In publish and subscribe, the message is pushed to the client. So long as that client is active, it will receive the messages that are published to that topic. But this is the point about publish and subscribe. If the client is active, it will receive the messages that are published. If the client is not active, it won't necessarily receive them. There is also a timing concept, and that is a client that subscribes to a topic 
can only consume those messages that were published after it subscribed to the topic. Any messages that were published to the topic prior to subscription will never be received by the client that has just subscribed. Now this timing can be relaxed a little bit. After subscribing, a client might become inactive for a while. But if we have created a durable subscription, then messages that are published after subscription, but while the recipient is not active, those messages will be held until such time as the client becomes active again. And so that gives us a little bit of extra flexibility. It's almost like mixing the concept of publishers and subscribe with queue. Remember, a queue will hold messages until the recipient asks for them. As I've already mentioned, messaging is inherently asynchronous here. There is no fundamental timing dependency between the production and the consumption of each message. However, we need to be a little bit more precise about this. When we talk about synchronous or asynchronous, we're really talking about the reception, the consumption of the message. So that the sender will call a method in the JMS provider. That bit is synchronous because we're calling a method to lodge a message. It's the reception thereafter that will be synchronous or asynchronous. Now a subscriber or a receiver can consume a message synchronously by calling the receive method. Now the receive method will block, in other words, that client that issues the call to receive will then stop processing and wait until either a message is sent to it by return or there's a timeout period that has elapsed. Now that's the idea of synchronous communication. We can make the message consumption entirely asynchronous by using a message listener. We've talked a fair bit in the past about event listeners. A message listener operates in a very similar way. So we would register a message listener and when a message arrives, a callback method in the listener will then be called by the provider and the message will be delivered to that callback method. That then becomes truly asynchronous in terms of consumption. And that's how the push mechanism is implemented. Each of the subscribers will have registered a listener. That listener will then receive through the callback method the message as and when it is published. So here we've got some of the concepts illustrated. The connection factory will be the entity that creates the connection to the JMS provider. When that connection has been established, the client is then able to set up a session by getting the connection to create a session. And then the client will create, let's say, going to the left, a message producer for a given destination, or going to the right, will create a message consumer for a destination. So it's very possible that we would have one client that will create a message producer for destination X and then another client create a message consumer for destination X. And that's how they'll communicate through that destination. If that destination is a queue, then it will be point to point. And if it's a topic, it will be publish and subscribe. By way of illustration, let's take a look at a segment of code. This code is in the projects that you can download from Blackboard. On the left, we've got the producer. And you can see through the use of annotations that we are setting up references injecting dependency. So we have a connection factory, a queue and a topic. You can see that the resource has a mapped name, that's the Jindi name. And so when the dependency injection occurs, the environment will automatically find those objects and put the references into these variables. Now the producer's job is to send a message. Now this particular example will require some kind of parameter on the command line to say whether or not it's going to use a queue or a topic. That's not so much the issue at this point. It will use that value destination type to determine whether to set up a destination for queue or for topic. This is the bit that's of interest at the moment. And there's a similar thing over in the synchronous consumer. You can see that for both, we use the connection factory to create a connection. And then from that connection, we create a session. And from that session, we then, in the producer, 
create a producer object for the required destination. And in the consumer, we create a consumer for the required destination. Now, a producer's job is to send a message. To do that, we create a, in this case, a text message, which is one of the five types of message that we can send. We can set the text for that message and then call the send method in the producer. And that will send that message to the destination. In the consumer, once we have created a consumer, we can then start the connection and call the receive method. So this is what makes it a synchronous connection. We're calling receive. The parameter there is a timeout in milliseconds. So this example gives a very short timeout period. Either there's a message or there isn't. We probably would want to give it a slightly longer timeout period. And so by looking at those two bits of code side by side, we can see quite clearly the role of the producer and the consumer. There's another example, that of asynchronous consumption, and I'll leave you to look at that in your own time. The next few slides talk about how we can connect to these various objects. Again, I'll leave you to look at that in your own time. Let's focus a little bit more on the message-driven beans. Each bean will require a connection factory resource, a destination resource, and a physical destination to which that resource refers. That's all taken care of by the Jindi. When a message-driven bean is created in NetBeans, the IDE will generate the connection factory and destination resources and add them to the module. And when you deploy your application, that physical destination is generated. Now, the message beans usually act as JMS message listeners. In other words, they'll have the on message method. Now, this next point indicates that any J2EE component can be used for sending messages. That could be an application client, an enterprise bean. So it could just be a session bean that you're writing, or it could be a web component. Any kind of class could make use of the Java messaging service. Message-driven beans resemble stateless session beans in as much as they will exist only for the duration of that request. When the message is sent, the message bean is set up by the container to receive that message and process it. But it's very possible that the container will actually manage a pool of these message-driven beans. So we could have multiple instances of these stateless beans that are concurrently in existence and receiving lots of messages. And if a particular JMS provider sends a message to a message bean and then sends a second message to the same message bean, it might not actually be the same instance of that bean that receives it. So we have to be very careful that we don't store state between the different messages and certainly not any client state, any message state. Some state might be maintained in the beans and that will be information that is not specific to a particular message. So for example, we might have an open database connection, but it would not be appropriate to store information from message number one that could then be accessed by message number two. We really ought to keep a separation between those messages in that respect. It's important to realize that client components don't locate these beans themselves and they don't call messages directly from those message beans. Clients interact with the destination and it's the destination that will decide to send a message to a bean and which instance will be used is up to the container. And when that message arrives, the container will call the onMessage method. Now that method has got to process the message. The message will be one of five different types. In the code that we looked at just now, the producer and the consumer were working with a text message. But there are four other types, a map message, bytes message, a stream message, and the other is an object message. Now, for us to be able to send objects down such a stream, we have to make sure that those objects implement the serializable interface. So when in the tutorial exercises, you're asked to set up an object message, if it doesn't work, the first thing to check is that your object message has actually been serialized. And for that to occur, when you declare the, the, the class, public class, class name, implements java.io.serializable. 
Therefore, the on-message method will first have to cast the message that it has received into one of these five types. And that's where the sender and the receiver have got to have a common understanding of what type of message is actually being passed between them. What happens next, of course, will depend entirely upon the application's business rules. How we process that message will depend on what the requirements of the business are. It might be that it will cause some update in the database. And this is where transactions will come in useful. Because if we're going to deliver a message to a bean within a transaction context, it means that if that transaction fails for whatever reason, all the operations within that on message method will essentially be undone when we roll back the transaction. Not only that, but the message processing will also be rolled back. That is, the JMS provider will then consider that the message was never sent in the first place. And so it's rolled back to that state pre-consumption. And the provider will then recognize that it has to deliver that message again and will continue to attempt delivery until the consumer finally consumes it properly without the transaction rolling back. To make a message bean class, we will use the message driven annotation. The class must be public. It cannot be abstract or final. It will have a public constructor with no arguments. In other words, a default constructor. And we must not define the finalized method in that class. We have an example here where we are setting up a message driven bean. This is the name of that bean a bit of configuration taking place and it's going to implement the message listener interface which means that it's going to provide an on message method it will receive the message of type message and will then have to do a bit of type conversion before processing it you can see the use of the transaction element here where if there is an exception for some reason or another we are able to roll back the processing of that consumption and so in concept, it's fairly straightforward. What you actually do with the message, as I said a few minutes ago, will depend entirely upon the business rules. So session beans and entity beans can both send JMS messages. They can also receive messages synchronously, but they cannot receive them asynchronously. But message driven <coughs> beans can receive messages asynchronously. So if you're in the business of needing asynchronous messaging, then you will need to make use of message driven beans instead of session beans or entities. As I mentioned a few moments ago, you can download the demonstration projects from Blackboard. Please take a look at them and see exactly how the queue and the topics work. Also how you set up the synchronous and asynchronous consumption. That's it for today.